Skipping forward a week in our liturgical year to late in the day of Easter, Luke's Gospel tells us that the disciples were walking together on the way to a town called Emmaus. No one knows today where this place, Emmaus, actually was. It doesn't exist anymore. But they can guess. There are some good guesses. There are about three different sites where people believe Emmaus might have been. And people still visit them to this day. Well, what happened on the way to Emmaus, on the road there, is that the disciples were talking about all the things that had happened over the last few days. And along comes this man that they didn't even recognize who's walking along with them. If you don't know which man I mean, you'll have to stick around and hear that story later. But the point is that the man asked them what was going on, and they said to him, are you the only person in this country who doesn't know the story of the things that have happened over the last few days? And so they began telling the story again. Now the story itself is a long and complex one, and it is the tradition of the church to retell the core of it on this day. To retell the story of the passion, the suffering of Jesus. And because we still have the place and we can see the places, but we don't have the people who were there, we have to rely on secondhand accounts. We retell every year a version of the story on the basis of one person who was there, one person who knew. This year, I want to share with you the story of the suffering, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Coming forward a few days from the story we just heard of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, where he came in and was proclaimed as King of kings, Lord of lords, when he, when he came in and people were throwing palm branches on his, at his feet, kind of like you'd roll out a red carpet these days if this were Hollywood. They didn't have red carpets then. What they had was palm branches. They, the same way you would throw rose petals down for a bride, they were throwing palm branches in front of the feet of Jesus to treat him like royalty as he entered But fast forward a few days, and now it's Friday, and everything seems very different. Something has gone off the rails in a big way. No one is entirely sure what went wrong, but from the point of view of the disciples who now have dispersed, who are all over the place, they've run away in fear and in shame. They didn't intend to run away. Jesus said, I know you will. Peter said, I know I won't. Jesus said, by the time the cock crows, you will have have denied me three times. And they did. They ran away. How did it get to be like this? There were signs. You know, back in the day when Jesus' message was easy, when he just preached to his friends on the side of hills, and told them stories and gave them good tips for living. Everybody loved it. That was before he got all political on them and started telling things that made stuff difficult. Once you bring politics in, it gets hard. That was before he started challenging people who actually had authority rather than just railing at some abstraction. That may have been when it went off the rails. As best as any of the disciples can remember, the problem went back as far as the time that Jesus had been teaching and telling nice stories and curing the sick and healing the blind and and casting out demons. Suddenly something changed. Jesus seemed to get all serious. And he he took all of his disciples out for what they thought was going to be a a weekend retreat getaway. They went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus seemed very preoccupied. And he had asked them, who do people say that I am? And they guessed. They said, well, you're a good speaker. People think you're a prophet. Some say you might be Elijah. 
Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, you know Peter, he guessed right. He said, well, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, yes, I am. And it wasn't long after that that Jesus took an even smaller group of the disciples up to a mountain to pray. He was always going off to pray. That might have been part of the problem right there. This, this insistence that knowing and understanding and doing God's will were key to why we were here in the first place. It's not practical. It doesn't get things done. But Jesus was always insisting on going off to pray. So he takes some of his favorites, Peter, James, and John. They go up on this mountain. Now, we're not supposed to know what happened because Jesus told them sternly when he came down, do not tell anybody, but the disciples are not good at keeping these secrets. So we know that what happened when they got up to the top of the mountain was that Jesus changed. Change is not a good enough word for it. He was transfigured. He started to glow a dazzling white up on the top of the mountain. And there with him were Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, Elijah himself in bodily form, standing there with Jesus. Just a few days before, they had said, some say, you're Elijah. Well, here he is. And then it ended. And they came down the mountain. Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Jesus was beginning to get weird on them, and they were beginning to worry that he might be losing it. They were all behind him in the message, but come on, you've got to be practical. And sometimes you even have to go after the leader to save him from himself. And certainly that was Judas's philosophy. Judas was the one who remembered that, you know, this costly oil, we can't afford this. All these stories to Mary and Martha about you've chosen the better way, that's nice. That's nice and all. But people have to get things done around here. And Judas was the practical one. And seeing that things were getting out of hand and that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to confront authority, he was coming in right at the time of the Passover, the big festival. There was not one of many temples. There was the temple. Everybody came from miles around. It was a, a huge festival because in addition to the Passover itself, that happened at a certain point in time. There was this whole season of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread where they remembered their time in Egypt. And they remembered that they had to leave so fast without even waiting for the bread to leaven. And so that season went on for days. It was a big holiday time. And then you would get to the part, uh, you would get to the part uh, towards the end of the week the Passover itself and people who had prepared their lambs for slaughter, the spotless lambs, they would bring them to the temple and to the, to the high priests who would take them up to the altar. And they would put these lambs up on the altar and they had grooves cut into the altar itself to catch the blood because this was a bloody affair. And they would take lamb after lamb after lamb who had been made ready and they would slaughter the lamb right there on the altar. It was such a bloody affair that despite the grooves, nonetheless, there was so much blood that it poured over the front of the table. It poured off the altar and down the stairs. This was a big holiday. And a lot of people were in town. Jesus picks this day to come into town. Pontius, or Pontius Pilate. Judas knows this is going to be a problem. So he decides to mitigate the situation. He goes to the high priests and the scribes and he says, well, what would you pay me to let you know where Jesus is going to be when there are not a lot of people around so you can arrest him quietly and not cause a big stink right here in the middle of your festival? And they offered him 30 pieces of silver and he took it. And he said, I'll be in touch. The one that I kiss... That's the one. So the die was cast. Everything seemed like it was going so well. How did we get to this day, this Friday? 
Jesus had called the disciples together and told them, go over there, talk to a certain man. What certain man? We don't know. Matthew doesn't tell us. And says, get me a room. We need a place that we can celebrate the Passover together. They go, they ask for the room. He provides it. And they're together and everything seems to be going okay. When Jesus gets weird on them again, he begins washing their feet. Washing their feet. It's disgusting. And it's servile. It's beneath him. And Peter protests again. This is unbecoming of the Messiah. And Jesus is having no part of it. And then having done that, he gets to the dinner part, he takes the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take and eat this, this is my body which is given for you. And then he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in memory of me. And I'll tell you something else. I'm not going to drink wine with you ever again until I drink it with you in paradise. But that was last night. Well, Judas knew that things had gotten to the place that he needed to intervene. So he sent the signal. He gave Jesus the kiss. And he was arrested. Jesus was taken away. That's when all the chaos began. He went to the, to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. And Caiaphas interviewed him and kept asking questions and leveling charges. They were not happy with Jesus because he had been, he had been challenging all the authorities all along. And they were asking him all these very pointed questions and accusing him of all sorts of crimes. And that's when the disciples started running away. That's when they realized that their lives were in danger and that they had better run. That's when Peter denied Jesus. And Caiaphas is asking him all of these questions and he's claiming that he can, if you tried to harm him, he could tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. It's out of control completely. And so the disciples are now nowhere to be found. And Jesus has spent the evening in the home of Caiaphas under guard and imprisoned. So that takes us to this morning. It's Friday. And Jesus wakes up in the home of Caiaphas. Not the home, in a dungeon. He wakes up and they grill him and they taunt him and they realize that they're getting nowhere. Meanwhile, Judas realizes this has gone a lot further than I ever realized that it has. And, and Judas takes the 30 pieces of silver back to the priests at the temple and he says, this is blood money. This is not what I had in mind. I just needed you to give him a good talking to. And they say to him, that is not our problem. You go and figure this out. You fix it yourself. So Judas took the 30 pieces of silver and he threw them on the floor of the temple and he ran away and he fixed it himself. All right. He hanged himself. He had no other choice. He had nowhere to go. Now, if one of you were to throw 30 pieces of silver on the floor here, we'd pick it up and we'd put it in the bank. But they couldn't, because the chief priests knew this was blood money. So they did what they could do. They took the money, they collected it, and they went and they purchased a field from a potter up on the Mount of Olives, up on the hill overlooking Jerusalem. Now it's part of Jerusalem, because you know how cities grow. But at the time, it was well outside the city gates. It was on a hill that has a lot of cemeteries on it. But then, as now, Jews are not buried with other people. They have their own cemeteries. So the priests bought this field from a potter for the purpose of burying foreigners who were in the area who had died and needed a place to be buried. And it's called the field of blood to this day. 
Well, Caiaphas realized that he had taken this as far as he possibly could. He could not make Jesus confess to anything. And furthermore, as much as he wanted to see this guy dead, it wasn't going to happen because the Jews didn't have the death penalty. But this story is filled with occasions of people who want things to happen and want the blood to be on someone else's hand. And Caiaphas had an idea. He had Jesus sent to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. This guy was scum of the earth. He was an unappealing character, but he did know how to get things done, this Pontius Pilate. So, on Friday, the big day, they take Jesus to the governor's house. Pontius Pilate was not interested in any of these religious questions. He was a Roman. Those were the, those were the affairs of the Jews. He didn't really care. But he did care about one of the charges. They had charged that Jesus claimed he was the king of the Jews. Now, if he's king of the Jews, that's a political thing. That means you're setting yourself up against the emperor. If that's true, that's a capital offense. So Pilate starts with a pointed question to Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, you say that I am. Pilate's looking at Jesus and thinking, this man has done nothing wrong, but he is determined to screw this up. All he has to do is deny the charges because there is no evidence, but he won't even do that. And he says to Jesus, do you realize that these are serious charges? Do you realize the stakes? Do you realize that if you're guilty of what they say you are, I'm going to have to have you put to death? And Jesus is absolutely silent. And it absolutely dumbfounds Pontius Pilate, who doesn't know how to respond. But he has a good idea, too. Because it's the festival, because everybody is in town, because they're doing all this dressing of lambs and everything, it was the custom of the Roman occupiers to release one prisoner every year, anyone that they wanted. And even though it could have been anyone that... that uh, anyone that the people suggested, Pontius Pilate had a great idea. I'm going to give them an offer they can't refuse. I'm going to give them a choice that is so obvious they have to let this guy go. So Pontius Pilate said to the crowd of Jews who had gathered below him to knowing that this was coming, he said to them, would you like me to release Jesus Barabbas? Now, what you probably don't know about Jesus Barabbas is that he was an awful, awful criminal. He deserved to be in jail. It would be like the governor of California coming out and saying, would you like me to release Charles Manson? Well, no, it isn't going to happen. So up till now, he's pretty shrewd. But then he says, or would you like me to release, and he made a key error, Jesus the Messiah? Because he had heard that name, he had heard that people called him that, but this is precisely what was infuriating the people. This is precisely what was setting them off. The nerve that this man would dare to allow himself to be called Messiah. Pontius Pilate didn't know this, but he was set up. And the crowd itself didn't really know. They didn't know so much who Barabbas was, and they didn't know what to do. It reminds me of going to a diocesan convention when we have all of these elections for people that, that get put in roles and everybody gets to vote, but no one knows who to vote for. So they all turn to their priest and say, do you know any of these people? Who do we vote for? The same thing happened. The high priests who were really offended by Jesus's um, challenges to their authority told the people, at all costs, this man must die. So, knowing those things, when Pontius Pilate came out and said, do you want Jesus Barabbas? Or do you want me to release Jesus the Messiah? Before they could answer, Pontius Pilate's wife came to him and said, I have had the worst dreams over the last few days about this guy. And it's been tormenting me all day long. Whatever you do, do not put this man to death. 
Pontius Pilate goes back to the crowd and says, Do you want me to release Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Messiah? Big mistake. And the crowd says, Give us Barabbas. Pontius Pilate has no idea what to make of this. He was not expecting that answer at all. And he just started sputtering at them and said, Well, okay, but if I release Barabbas, what do you want me to do with this other Jesus? And providing the line that has occupied Palm Sunday worshipers for centuries since, the crowd yelled, crucify him. And again, Pilate was incredulous and he said, why? What has he done? Well, if you've ever studied uh, communications theory, you know that you don't have to answer the question they ask. And so staying on message, the crowd yelled, crucify him. And Pontius Pilate was out of options. So he sent in for a bowl of water and he washed his hands on the ledge in front of them in water and said to them, my hands are clean. If you want me to do this, his blood is on your hands. Now Matthew says, and I don't believe this, but Matthew claims that the crowd yelled back, let his blood be on our hands and on our children. And the die was cast. Barabbas was released. And Jesus of Nazareth was taken away and flogged. Now, the Roman governor's own people had them at at, uh, Pontius Pilate's place and then took him over to to the headquarters. And once they got him there, they stripped him of his own clothes and put red robes on him as a sign of royalty, as a way of saying, oh, yeah, this is the king of the Jews. And they taunted him and they mocked him and they made a crown out of thorns and they pushed it down on his head, pressed it down into the flesh. And it was so tight that as he pulled at one part to try to relieve the pain, it would pull then on the back and hurt all the more. And as he released it, that same thorn would dig right back in to that same place. They took a reed, much like the palm branches you have in your hands now, and they put it in his hand like a mock scepter to make him look like he was some pseudo king. And they mocked him and said, how's it going now, king of the Jews? And then they took the the reed away from him and they started whacking him over the head with it. And when they had done all these things and he was ready for crucifixion, he was so beaten down that he couldn't carry his own cross, which is what they would normally do. So they, they laid it on a man named Simon of Cyrene and they made him carry the cross. They took him to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they crucified him. And it didn't happen quickly because crucifixion is not a quick affair. Crucifixion is agonizing and public and humiliating and horrible. And it takes a long time. And as he was on the cross, they nailed a sign to the top of it that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, just to mock him all the more. And things started to get worse. It was around high noon. It was was Friday in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. And Jerusalem being in a desert place not unlike this, they were also unaccustomed to clouds forming and coming together. But at noon on that day, the sky started to get black. The same way that it had back when Jesus was baptized. The same day when he was in the... The same as it was when he was in the Jordan River with John the Baptist and suddenly there was a huge cloud and and from that cloud came the voice of God saying, this is my son, my beloved. And a... The Spirit of God, the breath of God, had descended like a dove. Well, in the same way now, at high noon, it was a black sky. 
And it stayed that way for another three hours. And during this time, Jesus continued to be mocked. For example, they were crucifying two other people with him at the same time. And bandits on either side of him, on their own crosses, were yelling back at him, having heard the stories of how he had been treated at Caiaphas' place. They taunted him and they said, Hmm, if you could tear down the temple and have it rebuilt in three days, let's see what you can do now. Why don't you try and save yourself? And in the same way, now that it was safe, the chief priests and the elders were showing up too to watch him and to mock him all the more. And they had questions of their own. Hmm, he saved others. Can he save himself? Why don't you come down off that cross? And he didn't, because he couldn't. And this went on for three hours until finally he yelled out in a very loud voice in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from the cry of my distress? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he lingered even longer. And he hung out in the midday sun until he could stand it no more. And finally, again, that breath, that breath of God that had come into him at his baptism, he took a very deep breath and released it and breathed his last. <gasps> If you've been to the Holy Land, if you've been to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that they built on the site of the resurrection and on the site of the cross, you know that there is a rock there of Calvary. That was where Jesus was crucified, they tell us. And there's a crack in it. Matthew's Gospel tells us that at the moment of the crucifixion, there was a huge earthquake and that the ground where the cross was, was broken in half. Well, certainly there is evidence that there has been an uplift of that rock from an earthquake, and it is broken in half. Whether it happened the way Matthew tells it, we'll never really know. Matthew also tells us that inside the temple, at the very core where the Holy of Holies is, the Ark of the Covenant, that place is surrounded by a huge curtain, and only the chief priests, only the very highest people go in there, and then only once a year. They go in there just to tend to the ark, and other than that, that curtain is the barrier between the presence of God, heaven, and the world, earth. And that curtain, Matthew tells us, was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. The barrier between heaven and earth was broken the same way that the sky was opened and the Spirit of God came upon Jesus at his baptism. So the barrier was broken again. And when it did, 
Heaven leaked out in unexpected ways. Scripture tells us that the tombs of the dead were opened and that the people got out of their graves and walked freely right into the city and interacted with other people there. And on seeing all of these things, the centurion, one of the Roman soldiers who had put Jesus to death, looked at him on the cross and said, Truly this was God's Son. 